So we're going to be, uh, we're still in our study tonight, drawing out Moses. We're going to actually finish this up the end of December. And then we're going to move, like I said, we're going to move right into the life of Joshua. We're going to study that. I just thought that was fitting to go into that. And uh, so that will be uh, a lot of fun. I've never done a study on the life of Joshua, so I got some studying to do. <laughs> so y'all don't call me for the next six months. <laughs> but uh, God is good. Amen. Got another great uh, lesson for you tonight about Moses and uh, I had to pray a lot about this. This is one of those lessons that you hear about a lot. And so, like Pastor Darrell says, a lot of times you've got preconceived notions of, of the story. You think, well, this is how it is and this is what happened. But then when you read and study, and I was saying, God, give me something new. Give me something fresh. Show me this and show me that. And so, as always, God waits to the last minute and starts showing me. So as I was right walking in, I was like, oh, what is that scripture? And I'm trying to write that down. But uh, God is good. And God is faithful. Love you guys so much. Appreciate y'all. As we go into Christmas season, Thanksgiving season, hearts are tender right now. And uh, it's a great time to invite people to church. Amen. They'll come right now, those CEOs. (laughs) Christmas, then Easter only. (laughs) We pray it won't be the only time they come. We pray they'll come back. Amen. Amen. If you can get them here twice, we, we, we got them. Right. We got them. And if they come one time and they're like, you know, but if they come back again, we got them. Amen. Amen. So you just invite. Amen. Amen. How many of y'all watch baseball? Watch baseball. Y'all know the Braves won the World Series, right? <laughs> Is anybody like me? You ordered a World Series sweatshirt and you ain't got it yet? I ain't got mine yet. $80 for a sweatshirt. Pastor, I'm sorry. You didn't know that. <laughs> And I ain't seen that thing yet. So I'm waiting on that. And uh, every time the mail comes and brings a little package, I know it's not it. That I got one today, and it was rattling today. And I thought, well, I know that's not it, because the sweatshirt should not be rattling. But anyway, you might like watch baseball. Baseball fans in here. I'm just an overall sports fan. I mean, I, I just I don't know why. I just love it. Pastor Darrell worked. He tells you so many times he worked in the supermarket for so many years of, of our marriage. And so that, you know what that meant? He worked every weekend. So guess where, guess where Donna's at? She's at home with the two kids. And back in the, this day, this was forever ago, you know, back with the ark, that we only had a few channels. We didn't have 220 channels. We had a few channels. And guess what's on those channels on the weekend? Sports and football. And so I be- that's how I became a sports fan, sitting at home with my husband working, and I stayed at home, very little money to speak of. And so I had to stay at home, you know, and cook soup and watch football. And so I became a sports fan out of that. Amen? I don't know why I'm sharing that with y'all. Anyway, I just love sports, love football, uh, baseball, all of it, and I was so excited about the Braves. If you're a sports fan or not, you should be able to complete this phrase. Everyone should be able to complete this phrase. One, two, three strikes, you're... Yeah, that too, yeah. No ball player wants to hear that. One, two, three strikes, you're out. Nobody wants to... Whether you're in Little League, whether you're five years old in Little League, or you're in the Major League, nobody wants to hear that. Tonight, we're going to talk about... The moment in time that our very own man of the hour strikes out. Moses strikes out. Which 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 blows me away. I was telling Pastor, I said, if Moses struck out, I think we might be in more trouble than we realize. (laughs) You know? But anyway, that's what we're gonna talk about. Go to Numbers chapter twenty. Numbers chapter twenty here. We're gonna read a story here. About Moses, uh, like I say, you've probably heard a little bit about this, you know, just throughout your Christian walk. You've heard it maybe mentioned in sermons, but I pray tonight that you'll have a deeper understanding of exactly what happened in the life of Moses. Moses uh, Numbers chapter 20, let's read 12 verses here, 1 through 12. It says, Then the children of Israel, the whole congregation, came into the wilderness of Zen in the first month, and the people stayed in Kadesh, And Miriam died there and was buried. Talked about Miriam a couple of weeks ago. This is the scripture where she dies uh, dies and is buried. 
Now, there was no water for the congregation, so they gathered together against Moses and Aaron. And the people contended with Moses and spoke, saying, If we had only died in our, with our brethren, died before the Lord. When our brethren died before the Lord, why have you brought up the assembly of the Lord into this wilderness that we and our animals should die here? And why have you made us come up out of Egypt to bring us to this evil place? Can you believe these people? Jesus, is it not a place of grain or figs or vines or pomegranates, nor is there any water to drink? Verse 6, so Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly to the door of the tabernacle of meetings, and they fell on their faces, and the glory of the Lord appeared to them. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Take your rod, you and your brother Aaron, gather the congregation together. Speak, say speak. Speak, speak to the rock before their eyes. And it will yield its water. Thus you shall bring water for them out of the rock and give drink to the congregation and their animals. So Moses took the rod from before the Lord as he had commanded him. And Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock. And he said to them, Here now, you rebels, must we bring water for you out of this rock? Then Moses lifted his hand and struck the rock twice with his rod. And water came out abundantly in the congregation. And the animals drank. Then the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, because you did not believe me to hallow me in the eyes of the children of Israel. Therefore, you shall not bring this assembly into the land which I have given them. Father, we love you tonight. And we thank you, as always, for your presence and for your precious word. Lord, we ask you now to speak as only the Holy Spirit can speak to our lives tonight. Lord, we praise you. And we thank you for it now. Thank you. Your word will not return void. We glorify you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Moses, the children of Israel here, the people, the families, Moses himself, they had, Moses had given his life for these people to bring them out of bondage. You know that we've talked about that for several weeks now. They had survived the ten plagues. They had survived the Red Sea. They survived Pharaoh's army. They survived the desert sun. They survived the cold nights. The hunger, the thirst had followed them. It's 30 plus years now we're into this thing in Numbers chapter 20 here. The people here are still dealing with the same old problems. They're still, they're still hungry. They're still, it's still just not enough. And so now they come to another land here where there's no water. Moses at this particular time is old. He's old. He's working on 110 probably plus years at this particular time. He's just buried his sister Moses. We read that in the very first verse. His brother Aaron is older than him, so do the math there. So it's, it's, it's a tough situation here. The people had complained since the day Moses went and got them and brought them out. The people had complained and the people had murmured since they crossed the Red Sea. So Moses is not in the best of places in his life, to say the least. He's not in a good place. Just know this, sometimes your biggest test will come when you're at your weakest moment. It'll come when you're at your weakest moment. How many can testify to that? Those tests will come. Jesus himself found this out. After 40 days of fasting uh, and prayer, the enemy comes to Jesus and tempts him. But just like Jesus defeated him with the word, so we can. So we can defeat him just like Jesus with the word. Use that spiritual weapon of your mouth that you have. The most powerful weapon you may have, we've already sang about it, we're going to talk about it tonight, is in your mouth. The word of God tells us even if we want to move a mountain, we can speak to the mountain. That's how powerful our words are as we begin to speak it. Amen. So Moses is in a bad place at this particular time. The people are complaining again. Moses does the right thing here. He goes to God there in verse 6. As he goes to God, they fall on their faces before God, and the glory of the Lord appears to them. Moses and Aaron both go to God. Then in verse 8, God begins to give him. Moses is like just, you know, he has to fall. God, what do you want me to do? What can I do now? So God gives him very specific instructions here in verse 8 on how to handle the situation the instructions are really quite simple. They really are. It's a five-step process. Number one, he says, I want you to take your rod or take your staff. Take your rod. He said, I want you to get Aaron, get your brother. 
He said, I want you to call the people around and I want you to gather around the rock. He says, and then I want you to speak to the rock. And you're going to give everybody a drink. Doesn't that sound simple? Get your rod. Get your brother. Call the people. They're thirsty. It shouldn't be hard to get them there. Get them around the rock. Speak to the rock. And it's going to bring water as you bring. Sounds easy. Now, now some of you are probably asking, didn't we talk about this several weeks ago? As God, and we actually talked about it in Exodus chapter 17 when we talked about the rock. We did a whole lesson on nothing but the rock and how the rock represented Jesus. It was a representation of Jesus and how God told him. Actually, let me read that. Did I give you all that scripture? Exodus 17. And God actually, this is what God told him back in Exodus 17. So Moses cried to the Lord saying, what shall I do with these people? They're almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said to Moses, go before the people, take with you some of the elders of Israel. Also take in your hand your rod with which, with which you struck the river and go. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock of Horeb and you shall strike the rock and water will come out of it and the people may drink. So 25, 30 years ago, God had told Moses, strike the rock and water will come forth. Okay. We're later on now, we're, we're 30 years now, been in the desert, been in the desert here, and God's telling him something different. Before we see that Moses struck the rock, but this time it was different. This time it was different. So why was it okay then, but it was not okay tonight? That's what we're going to talk about. That's what we're going to talk about. Why was it okay then, but it's not okay now, we say it every week. I've said it already. Obedience brings blessing. Obedience. Disobedience brings curses. Okay? Disobedience brings a curse. Obedience is the key to your breakthrough. Obedience is the key to your breakthrough. Obedience is your key to get everything you need from God. It's being obedient to his word. What, and what we have to know is what God said to do last year may not be what God is saying to do this year, okay? That's why it's so important, like Moses, in every situation, in every circumstance, we go to God and we talk to God. The Holy Spirit will speak to you, amen? He will speak to you. He will commune with you. He will tell you, this is what I'm saying now. This is what I'm saying now. We got to keep that communication open with God. That's so important in our lives. A lot is so important for you. Know, a lot of times, even with Pastor Darrell, even in our services, what God instructed Pastor Darrell to do last Sunday, he may not instruct him to do this Sunday. That's important for us to know as Christians and as uh, members of the church. And a lot of people are like, well, why can't we do exactly what we did then? Why can't we do it every single week? Because that's not what ho the Holy Spirit is saying for him to do. Amen? Why can't you have, why didn't you have, we have people, not so much now as we used to. We've gotten past that, thank God. And I think that's through teaching. But why didn't you have the altar call? Why didn't you lay hands on the sick? Why didn't you anoint with oil? Pastor Daryl answers to God. He prays. Well, our job is to pray for him that he will hear from God. Amen? That he will hear from God. What we see here is a perfect picture of how God speaks to the leader, the leader of the group. We, we, we see here with Moses, God never addresses the people. He never addresses the people. He sends Moses to address the people. He speaks to Moses. He speaks to Aaron. And they address the people. He always goes through the chosen leader. You see, unlike a lot of people, God recognizes spiritual order. He recognizes that. Amen. God never is going to tell anyone else in, in the church how to run the church. He's going to tell the pastor. Amen what he needs to do and then what we have to do we talk about it a lot we have to learn to trust our leadership amen and we have to learn to know that he's listening to God now is that a huge burden on your pastor you better believe it is you better believe absolutely that's why like I said he needs your prayer not your judgment or not your questions. Why did you, why, why, why? You know, that's what Moses was doing. Why did you do this? Why? And Moses is like, I'm talking to God, y'all, every single day. Give me a break. This is what he's telling me to do. Amen. That's what he's saying. So anyway, get back five steps. Five steps. Take the rod. 
get your brother, get the people, gather around the rock, speak to the rock, and everybody's going to drink. What does Moses do? Verse 9, let me read it again. Can you put that back up there? I want y'all to see it again. Verse 9. So Moses took the rod from before the Lord as he commanded. And Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock. And he said to them, did God tell him to say anything to the people? He said, here now, you rebels, must we bring water for you out of this rock? Then Moses lifted his hand, he struck the rock twice, and water came out. What Moses did, the first three, he's good. He takes the rod, he takes Aaron, he gathers the people around the rock. Then he starts talking to the people. He starts calling them rebels. He starts calling them names. He starts preaching to them. He starts preaching at them. He starts preaching to them. The first three, he's good. Then he goes completely off the deep end. He began to speak to the people. He began to lift his hand with the rod. He hits the rock. Nothing happens, so he hits the rock again. And then water comes forth. And then water comes forth. What we see here happen with Moses turns a five-step process into an eight-step process. And when God's told you exactly how to do something, you add three steps, and you're in total disobedience. You're in total dis. God never told Moses to speak to the people. God never told Moses to raise his hand. God never told Moses to strike the rock. He certainly never told him to strike it twice. Have you ever wondered? Have you ever asked God a lot of questions when I was studying? Have you ever wondered why Moses struck the rock twice? He struck it one time and then he strikes it again. I think it's simply because nothing happened the first time. Water didn't come forth the first time. Do you think Moses knew immediately when he hit that rock the first time he was in trouble? Don't you think he knew immediately when he hit it? I bet he panicked there for just a minute, for just a half a minute. I bet he, when water didn't come out, but I think he knew. I think he knew he was in disobedience to God. Isn't it funny how we know when we've been disobedient? We know the minute we say it. Something we shouldn't have said, don't we? We know immediately that come out of your mouth. You're like, oh, I shouldn't have said that. And you know immediately, don't you? But what do we do a lot of times? We say it again because we're angry. And so we say it again. And then we go from disobedience. We go to rebellion. You've you've done something. You know you messed up. And I think Moses knew. So Moses knew. He hits the rock. Nothing happens. So what does he do? He panics. He hits it again. He hits it again. He strikes the rock again. And what does God do? God bails him out. God bails him out, right? He sends water. God told him to speak to the rock and he'd send water. Moses strikes the rock two times. And what does God do? God bails him out. God sends water rushing out. Water comes gushing out of the rock. Moses gives everyone a drink. Then some of the saddest verses we're going to read in the life of Moses is right here. Numbers 20, verse 12. I already read it to you. And it says this. Then the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron. He says, because you did not believe me and hallow me in the eyes of the children of Israel. Therefore, you shall not bring this assembly into the land which I have given them. I say this a lot. I say this a lot. There are consequences to your sin. God might have bailed Moses out. But there were consequences for his sin. There were consequences for his disobedience. There were consequences for his rebellion. A lot of times when we, like Moses, we decide to do things our way instead of God's way, God will forgive us. God will forgive. He may even bail you out and God will forgive you. But there are always consequences to our actions. As the people are over there, the water's gushing out. God sent the water anyway. The people are over there. They're giving the cattle the drink. They've got their sheep and the cow, whatever. They're all giving the drink. All the kids, everybody's getting fresh, cold water. God calls Moses over to the side. He says, come here. He says, come here. We got to talk. He says, after all we've been through, Moses, after all we've been through, the miracles, the signs, the wonders, the Red Sea, the plagues, everything, all the meet, all the ten of meetings that we've had, all the times in the Holy of Holies that we've spent together. Moses, I've been there for you. I've answered your prayer. You've interceded for the people, and I've been there. I wanted to destroy them, and you begged me not to, and I didn't. I've been there for you. 
After all of that, we've come all of this way now because you didn't believe me. You didn't believe that the simple process I gave you would work. Since you didn't believe and you were not obedient to my word, you have took matters in your own hands you took matters in your own hands. You have to believe anger was involved with Moses striking the rock. If you study that, he was angry with the people. He was tired. He was exhausted. Like I said, he was old. He's tired of dealing with these people. He can't please them. Nothing he does pleases them. So you have to know that, that anger was involved with the people complaining. So no doubt when he strikes the rock, he strikes it in anger. But God says, Moses, because, because of this, because of your unbelief, you cannot enter the promised land with the people. You cannot enter the promised land with the people. God was trying to teach Moses something that we're still trying to teach today. The valuable lesson of the power of your words. The valuable lesson of the power of your words. God had already told Moses earlier that it was his job to speak blessings over the people. He told him in Numbers 6, 23, he tells me, he says, speak a blessing over Aaron and his sons. God told him, he said, and it is you the leader, speak a blessing over the people. I will bless them. God's the only one that can bless, but it was the leader's job to speak the blessing over them. Y'all follow me? Y'all gonna have to go a little deep with me tonight, okay? It was Moses' job to speak a blessing, and then God would bless them. God was this early on, y'all. God was trying to institute the principle of death and life being in the power of the tongue. Being in the power. Moses was supposed to speak to the rock, not to the people. Okay? He was supposed to speak. Let me put it this way. God was Moses was supposed to speak the answer, not the problem. The answer, not the problem. You see, the answer to their thirst was the rock. That was the answer to the problem. But instead, Moses spoke to the problem when he goes out and said, You rebels. He spoke to the problem. He goes out and speaks to the problem. In Numbers chapter 14, 28, write that verse down. God says this. He said, as surely as I live, says the Lord, as you have spoken, so will I do. As you have spoken, God tells Moses, I will do whatever you say. Whatever you say, God listens to what we say, people. God listens to what we say. Most Christians are constantly cursing their own lives with their own words. And we do it so much we don't even realize we're bringing a curse on ourselves. As we speak evil over someone else, that is coming back on us. That is coming back on us. God, so God will do to us. Be careful what you speak over other people. Like Moses, I understand we get angry. We get angry with people. We get upset with people. But don't let that anger toward people cause you to bring a curse on yourself by speaking evil over them. And I know that's easier said than done. But God was trying to show Moses here in his instructions as he said, take the rod in your hand, but speak to the rock. Now, I asked God all week. I, I struggled with this because I thought, God, why did you tell him to take the rod but then speak to the people. What does he need the rod for if he's going to speak? He's not going to have to strike the rod. He don't want him to strike the people. That's probably what I would have done. Or a lot of us would have done. We're like, it's not, you know. So why did God say, take the rod, but speak to the rock? God, this is what God told me, y'all. God was trying to teach him that there was more power in his mouth than there was in his hand. There was more power in his mouth than there was. See, the rod represented power. It represented authority. But God was saying, you've got more power in your mouth than you've ever, ever, ever gonna have in your hand. If parents could realize that, parents, what you speak over your kids is more powerful than what you got in your hand. 
the words you speak. So many parents, they use their hands as a disciplinary too. And I believe in that. But the problem is what's coming out of your mouth. What's coming out of your mouth? We think what's going to make them strong, well-grounded kids is what we can give them. Can we give them a new car? Can we give them new clothes? Can we give them a new phone, a new iPad? All of this stuff that we're trying to give them with our hands. But the most important thing you can give them is the words that's coming out of your mouth. That's the most important thing you can do for them. That's the, the best thing you can do for your marriage. It's not material goods. It's not to buy that wife all this really whatever thing. The most important things is the words that are coming out of your mouth. Words coming out of your mouth. Most women that are verbally abused will tell you the same thing. I'd rather that he hit me than talk to me the way he talks to me. That's how powerful. That's how powerful our words are. Death and life is in the power of your tongue. A good principle for this lesson is this. I've kind of gave you a similar principle before. God changed it a little bit. Stop talking about your problem and talk about the answer. Stop talking about the problem and talk about, learn to pray the answer. Learn to pray the answer. If someone, this is a, a good example for this, and I've read this and I think I've used it before, but if someone is an addict, say they're a drug addict, or they're an alcoholic or whatever. So they're an addict. Calling them an addict is not going to bring them up higher. Calling them a liar or a cheater, that's not going to do anything to bring them up. As a matter of fact, that's going to that's make them worse, more than likely. That's not going to do anything to call them higher. When you go and say, you're nothing but a drunk. You're nothing but an addict. You always have been. You always will be. That does nothing to call them up. But when you go to that person, you go to that addict or whatever they may be, and you go to them and say, you know what? God's going to bring you out of this thing. God's going to bring you up. God's going to bring you out. God's got a greater purpose for you than what you're walking in right now. I'm believing for breakthrough in your life. I'm believing for God's purpose to be revealed in your life. You're going to come out of this thing. That calls people up, and that releases a blessing over them at the same time. Amen? Praise God. I told Mike Finch is sitting right here. He can testify this. I told him over a year ago, Brother Mike, I told him. Now, I am not taking any credit for what God has done in his life because him and his wife, they have been through it with this thing that he has dealt with. But I told him over a year ago, I looked at him and I said, God, you're going to walk out of this thing. I said, you are going to walk out of this thing. He'll tell you that. I told him. And, and, I believe, and I spoke live. That was speaking live. That was calling him up. Amen. You're going to walk out of this thing. Speak the answer. Speak the answer. Speak life and life will come. When the angel of the Lord goes to Gideon, the angel of the Lord didn't go and say, you're a coward. What are you doing hiding back here? No. He says, you mighty man of valor. He spoke the answer. He spoke life. He spoke life. Amen. And Gideon got up. Amen. He got up. We talked about it a couple of weeks ago. What kept the children of Israel in the wilderness for 40 more years was their mouth. Was their mouth. Joshua and Caleb said, they spoke the answer. They said, we can take the land. But the other said, they're giants there. We can't take it. They spoke the problem. Joshua and Caleb spoke the answer. They spoke the answer. Amen. Amen. Realize if there's more power in your mouth than there is in your hands. A lot of times we work tirelessly trying to make something happen, don't we? We work our fingers to the bone. We work three or four jobs. We're doing all kinds of things. We're wringing our hands. We're trying to find a way to work things out, work out details. But God is saying, listen to what's coming out of your mouth. Listen to what's coming out of the answer. The, the, the answer is in your mouth. Start speaking life. That thing, that situation, that person even that you've been speaking death over, that you've been speaking curses over, start speaking life. Just try it. Just try it and see what happens. Just try it and see what happens in your life. Instead of declaring he's an idiot or he's crazy or he's gone off the deep end, or he's evil, start, start declaring, he's coming out of that. 
I see greatness inside of him. There's something inside of him. God's going to use him in a mighty way. Start to claim. Let me speak that over you tonight. You're coming out of this thing. I don't know what it is you're dealing with, what it is you've been trying to work your fingers to the bone, what you've been trying to finagle and manipulate with your own mind and your own hands. God is about to make that thing easy. He's about to make that thing easy, and he's going to do it by you simply changing what you're saying. Amen? I'm declaring that over you. God's going to make something easy in your life that has been so hard for you because you've been working with your hands, and you're going to start using your mouth. You're going to start speaking life. Amen? You're going to start speaking life. Amen? Moses spoke to the problem. He spoke to the people. He spoke to the rest. God said, speak to the, rock, the rocks to answer. The rocks to answer. Okay, a lot of symbolism. I've talked about that before. Talked about all the symbolism in the book, in the life of Moses. Now I want you to imagine with me. Imagine you're Moses. You've led the people through the Red Sea. You've seen the bitter water become sweet. You've seen bread from heaven. You've seen waters flow from a rock that God told you to strike with a rod before. You did it and water came forth. Now many, many years later, you're wandering in circles. The people are complaining again. They're complaining again. You go to God. God tells you to take your brother, speak to the rock, water will flow. Now, let me interpret this for you just a minute, okay? God tells, God goes to Moses and tells him, before he told him to take a rod, he told him to strike the rock. Now he says, speak to the rock. So what's happening here, God tells him, hey, I want you to do something different. I want you to do something different. Something that's never been done before. Something that's never been done before. Something that's radical. Something that's out of the mold, Pastor Darrow, of Christianity. Something that's a little bit charismatic. I want you to speak to the rock. I want you to speak to the rock. Moses knowing, Moses knowing that if he goes out, he speaks to this rock, and nothing happens. These people are going to laugh him to scorn. Possibly be ready to stone him if he goes out and begins to speak to a rock. How foolish he's going to look if nothing happened. So Moses, what Moses does, Moses sticks to the old way of doing things. He sticks to the old way of doing things. He sticks to what worked before. He, forget what God said to do right now. This worked before. This is what they've always done. This is what brother so-and-so did. And this is what pastor so-and-so did back when I was at that church 50 years ago. And so that worked for him. So why don't you do that today? Because God said to do it this way today. Amen. Because God said, Moses' churches today, they don't want to do anything out of the ordinary because of fear, fear of failure, fear of, fear of losing a bunch of maybe a few well-to-do members. And they don't want to do that even though God is saying, I want you to do something different. Even though God is saying, behold, I do a new thing. It shall spring forth in you. Amen. And you shall know it. I don't really want to do it because I'm a fear it might fail and it might not work for me. Even though I know God said it and I know God is telling me to do that, I'm really afraid to step out and do that. And this worked before. People are more thirsty today, y'all, than they've ever been before. Than they've ever been before. We're in a time right now when God is calling us as leaders to do a new thing, to do what the Holy Spirit is saying to do now. Amen. Not what he said to do 20 years ago or he told somebody else years ago, but what God is saying for us to do now, to move with the new wind that is blowing in our lives right now and in our churches. God is calling, God is calling us to do some things that don't require the work of the hand, but it requires faith. It becomes faith of words, faith of words, so to move in a realm to where one word people can be healed. One word, the Holy Spirit can fall in a place, amen, through the power of our words. One word, people can made, be made whole. One word, people can be set free. Pastor Darrell read the scripture Sunday about what Jesus says in the light of day, you will do greater works than I've done because I go to the Father. We're talking about a greater works anointing that God is pouring out right now. Greater works. You know what Jesus said? He spoke a word. He said, arise and dead came forth. He said, Lazarus come forth and he came out of the grave. Amen. He says, be made whole. Blind eyes see. 
and things happen with the word, with the spoken word. That's a greater works anointing. Amen. Isaiah 43, 19. I did write that verse down. Behold, I will do a new thing. It shall spring forth. You shall know it. I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Let's not be afraid to move with a new thing. Let's not be afraid to move as God speaks to our pastor into a realm that maybe we've never been before. And you say, well, we didn't do this. We didn't do, well, we're doing it now because God said, we're going to do it this way now. Amen. God said, let's not be afraid of that. The scripture says, now faith is, right now. Now faith is, not yesterday's faith or 20 years ago. Right now faith is, amen. God's still speaking to pastors. God's still speaking to leaders. God said, your greatest prayer for Pastor Darrell, for myself, for anybody that gets in this pulpit, your greatest prayer should be this, that they would be led by the Holy Spirit. That they would be, if they're not led by the Holy Spirit, we're just getting together and we're just having a good service. Pray that he would be led. Pray that I would be led. And I'm telling y'all from experience that that prayer is, is cause it's, it's easy to do like Moses to say, well, this is what I did before. So I'm going to, this was safe. I'm going to do it again. It's easy to do that every single week because this is what we, we do church. We say it all the time. We know how to do church. We know how to do church. You can tell us, hey, your main worship leader is out of town. We don't know where he's at, but he's out of town. Your second string worship leader, if that, I'm, I'm just saying that, y'all, I'm not trying to offend nobody. He's got kidney stones. We got your third string, and look what an amazing job he did. Amen? That's being led, Richie. That's being led by the Holy Spirit. And he got up here, and he poured his heart out. Pray that the people that get in this pulpit are led by the Holy Spirit. It's so easy to get up here and do the same thing, but if we dare step out, step out of that risk zone, step out and take some risk and allow the Holy Spirit to take over, there's no telling what can happen. No telling what can happen. Now let me bring this home for you. Jimmy, you come. Jimmy's still here tonight. Amen. Let me bring this home for you. Two incidences here in this lesson. Exodus 17, the people complained there was no water. Moses strikes the rock, water comes forth. Numbers chapter 20, 30 years later, the people in the region, there's no water, they complain. In Exodus 17, God says, strike the rock, the water comes. In Numbers 20, God says, speak to the rock. We talked about it when we talked about it before. Corinthians 10, 14, 1 Corinthians. And all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock, and that rock was Christ. The rock was Jesus. We've established before that the rock was Jesus. The rock in the desert that the water came for represented Jesus. Y'all with me? Y'all stay with me right here. In Exodus 17, Moses struck the rock and the water flowed. There was no need to strike the rock again. There was no need to strike the rock again. Somebody's going to get this in a minute. All he had to do was speak to it. The rock had been struck. The water was flowing. All he had to do to activate the healing, to activate the deliverance, to activate the peace, to activate the joy, to activate the freedom was speak to it. Since the rock represented Jesus, when he struck it the first time, the rock was, it was, the work was finished. The water was flowing. It was finished. It is finished. When he struck it the second time and the third time, he was crucifying God afresh. There was no need to strike it again. There was no need. It was a complete and finished work. Once and for all, it was done. It was done. Let me just tell y'all a secret. Let me just teach you something right here, right now. It's always been about Jesus. It's always, always been about Jesus. It's always pointing to Jesus. It's always pointing to Jesus. It's always pointing to the rock of our salvation, 
to our deliverer, to our healing. And when he was struck one time, that's all it took. That's all. We didn't have to strike it again and again and again. There was no need that the work had been done. It was finished with every strike. After, after the first strike, Moses was putting God to an open shame. He was putting him to an open shame. The second strike was disobedience. The third strike was rebellion. Disobedience is as the sin of witchcraft. Witchcraft was punishable by death. So Moses brings a death sentence on himself. Brings a death sentence. And you say, that, that's heavy. That, that's heavy. Leaders are held to a higher standard, y'all. Moses, he had a relationship with God. Moses knew better. Three strikes, Moses. You're out. It only took one. It only took one strike. After that, all you had to do was speak. All you had to do was speak the name of Jesus. All we got to do, y'all, is speak. Stand to your feet. Speak the name of Jesus. That's how much power we're talking about tonight. That's how much power. Every time, every time, as I relate this to us today, every time that we deliberately sin, that we deliberately participate in sinful acts, in sinful conversation, in a sinful lifestyle, we, just like Moses, we're in complete disobedience to God. And, and God, and God, and you know what he's forced to do? He's forced to call us over and say, look, come here, come here, come here, come here. I, I can't take you where I want to take you. You can't go where I want you to go. These acts of disobedience, these words, these cursings that are coming out of your mouth. I can't do what I wanted to do with you, Moses. You can't go to the promised land. You're you're affecting your destiny by what's coming out of your mouth. It's affecting you. I can't do what I wanted to do every time. Every time we sin, the scripture says if we sin willingly after we come into the knowledge of Christ, then we crucify Christ afresh and put him to an open shame. Every time we deliberately on purpose sin after knowing Christ, it's like striking the rock. Striking the rock again, and it only had to, it only took one strike. It only took one strike. Let me leave you with some good news. Let me leave you. The rock has been struck. Healing is flowing. Amen. Deliverance is flowing. Peace is flowing like a river. We activate it with our we activate it with our worship. As we begin to lift up a sacrifice of praise to Jesus, we activate that in our life. Those healing rivers, rivers of living water, we activate that in our life. Who needs that tonight in your life? Who needs that in your life? Give him praise tonight. Amen. We're going to finish up. We're going to finish up Moses in a couple of weeks. We're going to talk about his death and what I believe Moses did not enter the promised land, and I'm going to talk about that a minute, some things that God showed me about that. But what I want you to do tonight, if you are visiting or if you are new or if you're not comfortable with this, I understand. What I need you to do is if you say, I'm not comfortable speaking to anybody else about anything spiritual, you're just going to bow your head and close your eyes. But if you are, I want us to do something because we're being led. Amen? by the Holy Spirit. If you're willing to be led by the Holy Spirit and you're willing to declare something over someone, I want you to do this with me tonight. I want you to turn to the row behind you. So the first row is going to turn to the second. Y'all going to stay facing. Second row, stay facing this way. The next row, y'all going to turn to each other. Y'all got me? Y'all, I'm giving you an easy step process. Some of y'all are going to turn behind you. Some of y'all are going to stay straight. Is everybody facing somebody? Do you feel comfortable talking to that somebody? Y'all feel comfortable? If you don't, like I said, just close your eyes and bow your head. And you're just going to pray this to yourself. But if you're comfortable, here's what you're going to do. You're going to begin to declare something over these people tonight. And you're going to repeat after me. And you're going to say this. Tonight, I speak life over you. If you're dealing with sin, sickness, or disease, I believe 
and I declare that you're going to be set free, that you are set free from that demon, and you are made whole. I decree that your latter days will be greater than your past. I decree that no weapon formed against you shall prosper. I decree that crooked paths will be made straight and difficult things will be made easy. I speak life, hope, healing over you. And now, because I spoke a blessing over you, I receive a blessing in my own life. Thank you, Lord, for healing, for hope, and for life in Jesus' name. Praise God. Give him praise tonight. Amen.